uh, the webinar is live. I'm going to wait for a couple of minutes, uh, waiting for the audience members. I can already see attendees joining in, so I'll just wait for a couple of minutes till we have a sizable number and then get started. Hello, friends. Hello, I can already see a few attendees. Uh, welcome to Be Waste Wise. I'm Shweta Dandapani. I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. To give you a brief history of Be Waste Wise, uh, we started with one moderator in 2013. And last year in 2022, we had 12 moderators who came from different parts of the world tackling absolutely different subjects. Together, they're posing questions, they're teasing out insights and uh, guiding conversations that are more relevant to us than those in other online and offline places. Uh, since 2013, we've had more than 300 contributors who've taken part in this journey. Uh, uh, thanks a lot for a wonderful response for our last webinar, which was on how U.S. cities are pursuing and measuring zero waste goals. And this is just a reminder to you that if you would like us to pick a particular topic, cover a particular topic, or is there some panels that you would like to hear from, please drop us an email at connect at wastewise.be. And welcome to today's webinar. The topic for today's webinar is circular economy in the textile sector. We have Aditi Ramola, who's the CEO of Ambire Global. She is moderating today's session. Uh, Aditi is from the same organization as Vishwa Sudaranya, who is a regular moderator on Be Waste Wise. You can head to the video panel section of our website to see more of uh, his webinars, from, which mainly focus on the Latin American region. Uh, today, we, Aditi is going to speak to Andrea Bartle, who's a senior scientist at TUVN, and Peter Foster, project manager and focal point for circular economy at GIZ Columbia. And this is a reminder to all the attendees that your questions will be answered. Please use the Q&A section for your questions. Introduce yourselves in chat. And those of you who've shared your questions during registration, it's already been passed on to the speakers. Over to you, Aditi. Thank you so much, uh, Shweta. I'm just going to share my screen um, and my presentation. You see my screen? Yes, I do. Perfect, perfect. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much to the Be Wise, uh, Be Waste Wise team for having me here. And it's a true pleasure and honor for me to be moderating this webinar on circular economy in the textile sector. Uh, it is a very timely discussion today, and you're going to see why in a minute. Um, so when I was looking for the definition of textile uh, in the dictionary, it uh, said cloth, basically cloth, but cloth which is uh, can be knitted or could be woven. It could also be fiber, filament, or yarn that is used in making cloths. So that was the definition that we, uh, that we see. And uh, the uses of textiles, as we all know very well, we use them as apparel, which could be clothes and shoes. Uh, they're used in households, in furniture, in buildings, in vehicles, uh, as well as in products that are uh, in the medical field or protective equipment. And uh, what we know from studies is that between 2000 and 2015, uh, global textiles production has almost doubled. So just in, the, in a period of 15 years, uh, it's gone to almost double. And studies are also estimating that by 2030, the production will grow to about 145 million tons of textiles globally. So uh, that's a lot of textiles. And as you know, as as your you know as we consume more, uh, things also become waste. So our as we are producing more, we're consuming more. We are also producing a lot of waste. Um, in terms of the environmental impact, uh, textile production is responsible for almost 10% of global carbon emissions by some estimates. 20% uh, of global clean water pollution. And when you, when you talk about synthetic uh, laundry and so on, you, you have about 35% of microplastics uh, are ending up in the food chain because of uh, you know, textiles and so on. So as we, uh, as I said, as we increase the production um, and consumption, the impact on climate, water and energy consumption is also going up. Um, so just briefly, uh, as I said, it's a timely discussion just yesterday, the European Commission, so this is just a very um, looking at the EU, which is quite at the forefront of uh, circular economy in textiles. They released a proposal uh, just yesterday saying that they would like to uh, make producers uh, more responsible for reducing, reusing, and recycling textiles um, and for the sustainable management of textile waste uh, at the end. And a few important points that they mentioned that I just want to uh, throw light on is they talk about, of course, reducing, reusing. But they're also talking about mandatory and harmonized extended producer responsibility schemes 
uh, for uh, textiles in all member states, so all 27 countries. And they've also talked about uh, the requirement to collect textiles separately from 2025. And we're going to hear from our speakers, you know, what the challenges and opportunities in those uh, in those are. Um, the, the, the call for proposal is also talking about uh, promoting research and development in this field. And finally, they talk, they mention uh, waste, uh, so textile waste exports and trade, but, but they are not, they're not banning it. So they just, they just want to start addressing the issue of illegal exports of the textile waste in different countries and so on. Uh, if you want to look at the EU context, because it's it's written quite clearly and they've done a good study on how much waste they're producing, uh, EU is generating about 12.6 million tons of textile waste per year. And that comes to around, I think, they, they, they estimate it to be about 12 kg of uh, textile waste per person per year. Um, and uh, that, you know, it's not being managed and uh, treated properly. Most of it um, goes for incineration or gets landfilled or then or gets exported as well. Uh, so without spending too much time on this, I'd love to hear from our speakers. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, to you the two we have today with us, uh, Professor Andreas Bartel. He's a senior scientist at the Vienna University of Technology. Um, and he's uh, at the Institute of Chemical, Environmental and Biosciences Engineering, and he holds a PhD from the same university. Uh, since two, 2002, he's actually engaged in the same topic. Uh, so he's engaged in recycling fibers, from end of life products uh, such as apparel and tires. Uh, and he's very active in this field. So uh, we're looking forward to hearing from him. Our second speaker uh, for today is Peter Furster. He's uh, an expert with more than 12 years of uh, specific experience in renewable energy, uh, energy efficiency and circular economy. Uh, he's based in Colombia, uh, working for GIZ um, on, on various topics around circularity. And we're very happy to have them here today. They're gonna tell us uh, about the challenges that come with implementing circular economy policies for textiles. Uh, they're going to speak from their experience uh, working at the global level. Uh, and uh, Peter is also going to talk about the challenges, uh, particularly for the LATAM region where he works. Um, and so without further ado, I would like to pass it on to uh, Andreas first and then to Peter. Thank you. Over to you, Andreas. Yes, thank you. You can give me the right to share the screen. Um, you should see uh, a green arrow, yeah, good. You can see the screen? It works? Now it works. Yes, Andreas. Yes. Okay. yes, perfect. Thank you. So hello, everybody. Uh, yes, I will give a, sh a brief overview because I will try to stick in my, my time about textiles. Um, uh, in a circular economy, of course, yeah, let's see. Uh, well, if we speak about textiles, um, it was already mentioned that we have an ever increasing amount of uh, textiles as apparel and so on. So one of these very successful, let's say successful business model is the fast fashion business model, which, mean that, which means that we have cheap non-durable textiles that are put on the market in ever shorter delivery times and we have a frequent uh, change of collection. So we have a quite unsustainable and increased consumption. And the reason is that the brands that follow fast fashion uh, try to put on the newest style in ever shorted, yeah, it, as soon as possible. And yeah, you can see how successful this business model is. This is Inditex, one of the, the, the largest uh, producer or the largest brand in, in the fast fashion area. And they, yeah, from 2004 to 2022, uh, yeah, they have an average growth rate of 11% annually. And they also have a profit of 13.5% of the sales. So, uh, but this is only fast fashion. Maybe you have ever heard of uh, Shein, which is a Chinese company, this is we call fast fashion or super fast fashion, which is even faster. And in the last year, from 2021 to 2022, they have doubled their <clears throat> their sales, and they are almost uh, yeah behind, just a very little bit behind uh, Inditex with 28 billion 
uh, US dollars, uh, uh, sorry, euros uh, turn around. Okay, so we have an increasing amount, but this is a very successful business model. And maybe you have heard about this. This is the circle economy. So what is the idea of the European Union to introduce the circle economy? Okay, it should be, should create jobs. Uh, it should foster sustainable economic growth. It should promote uh, design, a circular design of products. And finally, it should bring uh, benefits to both the environment and the economy. So we can say it's check of all trades. And this was published last year by the commission, the textile strategy. So we need, so the EU commission plans to announce some uh, regulations or some directives in introducing eco designs for textiles, in preventing destruction of unsold and returned textiles. Uh, some in some, for instance, in France, uh, there's also there's already uh, enforced the the ban of destruction uh, and unsold or returned textiles. Um, so this could be a reason why so many textiles end up in the Atacama Desert. So maybe it's better to incinerate them in Europe than to dispose them somewhere else. But this is, yeah. Uh, of course, uh, the commission wants to fight microplastics. And of course, uh, textiles composed of synthetic fibers are a potential source of microplastics. Uh, there should be a digital product passport, which would bring a benefit for, for the consumer, but also for recyclers, because then we know uh, where this, this specific item has been produced, uh, which components it contains and where it has produced and then ethical, uh, under ethical conditions. Uh, also similar, the green claims, so uh, brands must not claim this product is green, this product is sustainable, if it isn't really green and sustainable. And finally, yeah, uh, it was already mentioned, EPR, uh, as we have it in, in most, in many countries in the field of packaging should be introduced in the field of textiles. Uh, this is not new. We have this in, in France since I think 2008. Uh, but of course we know that EPR has some advantages, but also that EPR alone will not solve the problem because as, as you may know, uh, EPR did not uh, reduce the amount of packaging and EPR did not uh, promote more sustainable packaging. So uh, let's hope that uh, the mistakes we made with EPR in the field of packaging, we will not make the same mistakes once again. So yes, my conclusions, we have the fast fashion, it generates jobs because someone has to produce this ever increasing amount of textiles. So it generates res uh, revenues. And of course the companies like to pay taxes and shopping makes happy. Everyone is happy to, to buy cheap clothes. And the circle economy, yes, of course, all the textiles are recycled and uh, we can use the, the materials once again. Uh, we will reduce the use dependence on raw materials and it will generate jobs. It is the perfect symbiosis. Okay, this is not really my conclusion because maybe this is not really the truth. Uh, okay, it was already mentioned, textile fibers, uh, or textiles basically consist of fibers uh, and they have to undergo a quite long processing check. Uh, chain, which is a little bit different to other products such as packaging or uh, let, let's say a pet bottle. So we have to produce the fibers, then we have to produce the yarn, then we can, can go to a knitting or weaving or a non woven process, then we need the wet processing like dyeing and finishing. Finally, we need cutting, sewing, and uh, this is a really long chain until we receive the final garment we can find in the shops or somewhere in an internet shop. Um, so which materials are used? Uh, so you can see that uh, the major part of fibers used for textiles are synthetic fibers. So they are fossil based. So they are, I say, not sustainable. Uh, we have cotton, but cotton, yeah, the, the amount of cotton stays rather constant uh, because we haven't got more cropland. We cannot increase the, the per hectare. 
yield, so cotton, the share of cotton will decrease as the synthetic, the share, the amount of synthetics will increase. Wool is not important. So the cellulosics, uh, which are man-made fibers, but they are based on natural on <clears throat> polymers. They grow similar in a similar range like the synthetics, but they are around 10% of the synthetics. So their importance is limited. And here you can see yeah, the total in 2021 was 113 million tons. And in 2022, we had already 119 million tons. Um, yes, if we speak about recycling, of course we want to recycle, yeah? Uh, but recycling cannot be the solution. We need recycling, but it is not the only solution. As you can see, we had 17, uh, 70 million tons of synthetic fibers in 2020. And if we are, let's say, in uh, my university and at other research institute, we do a great job. Uh, maybe we can realize 50% recycling rate in 2032. But if we can source 50% of synthetic fibers from polymers derived from end-of-life textiles, then we still need 70 million tons of new resources, of virgin resources. So the growth will just uh, compensate the technical advance. So recycling will be necessary, but uh, we urgently need to decrease this uh, insane growth. And it was also mentioned, uh, no one will go to the shop and buy uh, 10 grams of cotton or 50 grams of polyester. You go to the shop to buy a shirt, uh, trousers or something else. And as you can see, uh, okay, there's a big deviation, but the, in the optimal, in the best condition, uh, one ton of t-shirts needs to produce, needs five tons of crude oil. Uh, on the other end, it can even need 11 tons of crude oil to produce one ton of garment. So the problem is much bigger than uh, just considering the amount of fibers, the 120 million tons produced last year. And of course, I, all this, uh, we have carbon, em carbon dioxide emissions, we have water pollution and so on and so on. Um, so yes, some conclusion about the textile processing change. We have a lot of fibers, it continues rapidly. Uh, and also, of course, we have to consider that the textile production is spread all over the world, mainly in Asia, in low wage countries. And there's a significant share of water pollution. And of course, we have to face some social and ethical concerns regarding wages, working conditions, and working and safety uh, in this field. Uh, and finally, fast fashion. Yes, the price does never include the cost of environmental pollution and the price can of course not provide fair working conditions. So let me, yeah, this is a very um, frequently cited paper from the L. MacArthur Foundation. So the most important thing is that a real recycling, let's say fiber to fiber recycling is less than 1%. Uh, all the others is just a cascade utilization and the major part is landfill or incinerated. So how can we circumvent this? Yeah, we have different possibilities in recycling. Uh, so you can see if we stay on the, on the bottom, this means reuse, secondhand clothes. Of course, the saving potential is the largest because then we, it's not necessary to redo the whole production chain, which is quite long. And the bigger the cycle, uh, the less the saving potential in terms of energy, water consumption, water pollution, and so on. However, we need all these cycles because some cycles are not viable for all uh, input materials. So one thing I mentioned is, okay, uh, the commission wants uh, more durable clothing. Okay, apparel should be more durable. It should stand for more washing cycles, but can this be the, the pure solution? Uh, well, you can see this is a study from the UK. So 19% of the apparel disposed of was damaged, stained, lost, shape or worn out. 
but 75%, so three quarters, have been disposed of because didn't like, didn't fit, didn't need. So if the commission will make textiles or apparel more sustainable, more durable, uh, well, this will not influence didn't like, didn't need, didn't fit. So we need more than just a technical approach. We also need um, yeah, to, to get the consumer awareness uh, has to be raised and so on. So this is not a, let's say, one dimensional problem. So we need different approaches to solve these problems we have with this overconsumption of textiles. Uh, yes, collection. We need separate collection. Of course, this separate collection will be funded by the upcoming EPR schemes. So these are the data for Austria. So we can see that uh, two thirds can be reused, uh, but only a small fraction in Europe. But Europe does not mean uh, Austria, Germany. This means rather the eastern and southeastern part of Europe with lower uh, wages and a big amount is exported to developing countries, mainly Africa. Uh, of course, if we collect more, we can see this in Germany. And if we have an EPR scheme, uh, the share of reusable items will significantly decrease and the share of items to be recycled will significantly increase. So uh, it is quite important that we now which must develop recycling processes to face these items that are not capable of being reused. This was up to now, this was a chicken egg problem because uh, no one collected items to be recycled because there was no one who was asking for items to be recycled. And no one, on the other hand, no one developed a recycling process because these items have never been collected. So this will change in the, in the next years at least in Europe, is this new uh, textile strategy. Uh, yes, I come to my last slide. So we have some, hopefully some time for uh, questions. So recycling, we can say it is currently not well developed. Of course, it is under development. So I have several research projects now at my institute, uh, but this is quite new. This started, let's say three or four years ago. Before that, no one was interested in recycling textiles. Uh, yeah, new concepts under development, but I already told you, yes, we need recycling, but recycling only can never be the solution. Reuse, yes, reuse is, of course, shows the best benefit for the environment, but uh, normally we cannot sell these secondhand items in Europe, so we have to export them to Africa. So the question is, is this good? Which problems we cause there? So we have to be very careful uh, maybe not to destroy uh, textile industries somewhere else because we send cheap secondhand clothes to some developing countries. Uh, so maybe we should try to get um, to, to increase the share of secondhand clothes to be sold in Europe. Let's say vintage sounds much better than secondhand. Uh, how can we increase the repair and how can we fund this? So this could be funded by ET EPR schemes, but this, it depends on how these EPR schemes will be designed. And finally, fast fashion. Well, it is definitely fast fashion is not compatible with waste prevention, which is the utmost goal of the European waste hierarchy. And of course, fast, fast fashion will always cause environmental, social, and ethical concerns. Uh, so finally, we have yeah, to get rid of fast fashion and to move towards a more sustainable fashion and more sustainable clothing. Yeah, so this was my short presentation and I'm looking forward to some, for some questions I hopefully can answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andreas. So we'll move on to Peter before we open it up to question and answers. Thank you very much, um, Aditi and, and everybody here. Um, big welcome. Um, thank you for having me here, Svita and everybody. And thanks, Andreas, for, for this very, uh, very nice introduction and very broad overview of, of what's happening. And I would like to start by saying everything Andreas said is 
perfectly true in reality. And that's what we're facing here in Colombia. So um, I don't have a presentation basically of, for the main reason that we are just finishing now our, maybe in two or three months, we're finishing a, a broad study of, um, regarding the textile sector in, in Colombia. And so the, the numbers that we have would be irrelevant in, in two months. So I thought that it wouldn't be uh, useful for this space. So what I can do is at the end, um, if anybody's interested in this type of uh, document that we provide, I can share it with anybody who, who's, who contacts me. All right, so yes, um, the main, the main uh, topic or what I was, so, um, what I'm going to talk about is basically the challenges that, uh, that we have in the, in the Latin region in Latin America and focused on, on Colombia. And here, um, I would again underline all what Andrea said is basically the, the situation that we're facing now. Colombia is, is um, one of the largest economies in, in South America currently um, in a very strategic position uh, regarding world trade, geopolitics, uh, social topics, uh, environmental topics. So it's on the forefront of all these um, elements. So the GIZ, the German Cooperation Agency is working here uh, very strongly in topics related to um, uh, circular economy. My name is Peter Förster. I'm the, the, the project manager for one of these uh, larger um, of these larger projects that are working here in circular economy. It's called PROUSAR. It's basically a project that is focusing on the uh, on circular economy, but on the upstream sector. So we differentiate between the upstream and the downstream sector. So we work on the side before something uh, gener is considered waste. So before we, we, we throw it in a landfill, so before it, it, it's considered uh, not usable anymore. Uh, we jump in and we try to we try to 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 plan some actions to to minimize the amount of waste that at the end goes out. Um, we are um, a project with five uh, members, team members, and we work on three major lines. So one of them is uh, textile, obviously, which is the the the. The, the value chain that I'll be presenting or which I will be talking about right now, um, but we also work on, on, on electrodomestic electronic waste and um, we also work on packaging. So these are basically the three main elements that we, that we work on. With regards to uh, textile, so Colombia is and has been in the past a very strong textile produ producer. We do have here in our country larger um, uh, production lines for other for bigger brands. So Levi's, for example, produces your jeans. We have uh, from the cotton industry, we have shirts for Tommy Hilfiger and others. So there is a lot of um, there is a lot of companies here in the in the country that produce textile. And in the past, the textile sector was a very strong, uh, very important sector for the local economy and thus was always protected by the government. So it was always like kind of a, a very necessary and a very um, high value uh, sector. So this has generated some dynamics along the way that now makes it quite difficult to interact because right now we're facing strong competition from Asia. And, and so basically the, the companies that are here have lost market shares, have lost position around the world. So what there, anything that, that is considered a, 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 an additional burden to them, mostly the topic of, of uh, waste management, EPR systems, et cetera, both upstreams and downstreams are always considered in the first, in, in the first moment as, as an additional burden. So, what uh, what happened in the past is that at least the, the, the international cooperation, um, the German cooperation was very careful to work with this sector because besides the, the elements of, of, of material waste, the textile sector has also a very big impact on, on energy and on water um, uh, consumption and pollution in this in this same in the same sense. So, um, it's 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 a hard cookie. Uh, so when when presenting and developing projects to work upon the sector, it was always considered quite um, quite risky. So we had to be careful because there are also a lot of actors involved, and that is basically what we're mapping. But before um, to go in, into into maybe into more into more concrete elements, we agree uh, with what Andreas was saying that 
recycling is not the only, it's not the solution for the sector, and that is also a reality here in Colombia. Um, Colombia is, 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 is on the brink of, of working. Well, they are, the landfills, they are still having a landfill system um, in, in many of the bigger cities. So um, we, we had some numbers in the past that about uh, um, three of the main uh, waste categories that are, are, go, are getting to the waste fields are amongst organic waste and plastic waste, also textiles. So we know that the textile problem is a bigger one here and nobody has really tackled it. The, the moment the project uh, started working here, the, the, the government and the lo both the local government and on a national level all realized that this is something that needs to be done. It is going to be a long and harsh way, but the good thing is that here, that at least the, the, the industry, which is very well organized and, 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 and has a very strong presence along the country, is also interested in, in, in participating. So, what are we doing here? We are basically, um, as I said, we're not going into the recycling and, and at least not with, the, with this project I'm working on, um, into the recycling and, and waste management of textiles. But what we are looking at is basically the upper part. Everything that Andreas was uh, talking about, the reusage of textiles and how to, to um, have some countermeasures on the on the on the fast fashion industry and everything that it generates upon. So we're working on different layers. So the German corporation, um, the projects are, are are focusing not only on the on the on a technical support on companies on how to tackle the waste problem, but we're also working on social aspects. We're working on 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 me measuring and mitigating environmental aspects. So we're trying to 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 um, to work along the entire chain. Um, what we have, uh, what we have um, done so far, and what would be interesting in terms of, of seeing what Andreas is explaining on a on a more uh, theoretical way, and what we're trying to do here on the ground with regards with the companies and and with everything, we differentiate in two types of textiles that are, or in two types of, um, I would say markets maybe that are that the textile sector is 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 serving. The first one is, of course, everything that, that's for private use, what we go and what we buy and what the, the, the normal consumer is, is buying. This is basically the larger share. It's more than 70 percent. It's basically what, what we put on the market. But we have a second very interesting sector that, that is, in our opinion, the low-hanging fruit, where most of these aspects of upcycling are, at, of, sorry, of um, um, the, the, of the, um, the upstream sector can be applied is the industrial uh, the industrial element of, 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 of clothing. So for example, you have bigger companies that are, are, are for, by, by law need to uh, change the, um, the, the equipment of their, of their workers every three to four months. It's kind of a law that exists here where the, the companies have to provide everything that the workers are, are wearing. So if you're, for example, in the chemical industry or if you're, for example, I don't know, in the automotive industries and you're working, you have to be, you have to make sure that the, that the clothing that your that your company uh, workers are wearing is, is up to date and is is work is, is is suitable. So here, for example, we have seen that you have also a lot of disposal and a lot of things. So what we have tried to, to do with our project is to tackle these bigger companies and start working on on these, on how to um, generate, for example, modular lines that you can. Um, fix much more easier. So the idea at the end is to generate services from maybe existing companies or companies that could do it and provide this type of services for, for companies so that they don't have to change the entire uh, clothing line for their, for their workers. But you can refurnish only those parts that are really done. So what we're tackling basically the, 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 the production, what uh, Andreas was saying, we have to decrease this this fast production of, of, of producing new clothes all the, all the time, but we try to refurnish uh, the ones that we have. Besides that, we're also we're, um, we're working also integrating the, the, the social aspects. The textile sector has a very strong social involvement. That means that besides being a, a, a very traditional sector that um, Colombians kind of like and love and they, they appreciate, it's also a, a sector that requires a lot of um, uh, workforce. So even though the, the bigger companies are, are um, technified and have uh, very interesting technologies that are provide, produce, with uh, the use for production, there is a lot of still of, of labor, of, of uh, hand using labor. So 
um, here. Um, what we're doing is basically, and it's also an aspect that we that we saw in the presentation before, is trying to link certain social aspects to this uh, uh, to this value chain and trying to reduce the amount of waste by remanufacturing. This is something that we're providing to the to this to the to the first uh, market that I mentioned, the, the the private market. What we're what we're wearing as a, as a as 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 people. So the idea here is basically we have. Um, a lot of groups, mostly women, that come from from harsh conditions, that don't have any opportunities to 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 enter maybe into the labor force, etc., because of where they're coming from, what they've lived, and where they are right now. But we've seen that they have they're very well organized, and the idea is basically to provide and to work with larger brands to whenever you go to a to a shop and buy a shirt or a, or, a, or whatever, and something is something broke and that you're throwing away what mentioned what Andreas mentioned 75 percent of what you throw away is because you don't like it or something is broke and everything so the idea is that we provide a service for a customer that buys a shirt or buys something in a in a in a, in a, in a shop in a larger brand and that you can have this kind of services included into the price you pay so basically there will be that kind of idea that if you buy something you wear it two or three times something broke and you cannot fix it by yourself you have the possibility to go like kind of a warranty that is provided by these by this by these people, and um, this is something we're we're working with right now. We have um, a group of about 50 women now that are working in this in this in this aspect, and we're trying to help them to position them in the in the in the in the value chain to give them the the to give them um, a kind of a, a business case that they can provide and that makes this sustainable. And at the end, and maybe the last point, even though that this is what you just mentioned um, at the beginning, I think that the you know, European Commission is now with this, uh, with this um, larger uh, politics regarding textile. The Colombian, Colombia is one of the first countries that is uh, looking to implement an EPR system for textile. This is something very, very interesting. There have been initiatives in the past uh, that tried to implement an EPR system for textile and that have failed to different reasons. It's important to mention that Colombia has already different EPR systems for other uh, materials, for example, uh, tires, uh, batteries, uh, for the packaging, etc. And we agree with Andreas that these EPRs not always uh, fulfill their goals, mainly because the technical support and the information that they use to provide, for example, the, the baseline, on, and, the, and the goals that each company has to approve uh, to to fulfill over the years is kind of um, wage. So we we what we're doing right now, and this is something that Colombia is again on a very interesting position, is that this, the, the industry at some point said we would like to work with the government on this EPR system. Firstly, to to give the baseline, so to have to have clear on which on what on which uh, elements we're going to be working on and how to achieve these goals and how to make an EPR system applicable and and reachable for for for, for the main of it. But the second element, which I thought is was was kind of interesting, is, is also that the Colombians started to see that this could be a way of differentiating themselves from other providers in the in the world. So if they see, for example, what's happening in Europe and that you'll have to start uh, generating maybe to import certain products to Europe, a certain um, certain standards on your production and how you manage waste, etc. Colombians see this as a possibility to to stand out. And uh, what we're doing right now is basically we're looking at what Europe is doing and 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 the experience that other countries, just for example, as France and others have done in the past, and basically including in this EPR system also the upstream elements, so that. Not only it's going to be an EPR system regarding the, the waste management of whatever they produce, but also in the issues with regards to on how to optimize the production. So how to include either uh, recyclable materials, how to generate uh, concepts to minimize the amount of waste that their, that their products generate and the durability aspects, for example, that also Andrea is working. So here we're cooperating uh, strongly with a second project. It's, it's a global GIZ project that's called Gold Circular. And basically here we're trying to, to find, um, to help the public and the private part to jointly um, generate this EPR system uh, here in Colombia. 
this is basically a broad overview of what uh, we are doing here. We just started. We're not. Lo we're here for about eight months right now, so we still have a long way to go. We, we're here until end of 25, so um, we have still a lot of challenges. And the textile sector is the one that, even though it's a strong, it's tough, it's a tough cookie, and we know that's going to be a lot of work. We believe that it's the one that's going to be able to present the most um, impactable results, so to say. It's, it has a lot of potential and um, yes, I, we can only again agree on what Andreas was presenting on a, on a more global scale. We see this here in Colombia definitely on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, that will be my, my contribution to this, to this uh, webinar. Um, I'm very open and available for, for any questions and if you need information that we will be creating in the next couple of years, please feel free to contact us and I'll be happy to, to share it with you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Peter and Andreas, for such uh, valuable insights uh, and your presentation. Um, we will open uh, the floor for questions. I already see quite a few in the chat box. And also people had sent us in advance of the webinar questions as well. So there's going to be uh, plenty of time for discussions. Um, let's just take them one by one. Um, I, I think they're open-ended questions and both of you can answer. Um, so you can take it turn by turn. Uh, in fact, I think the first one is addressed to uh, Andreas, and it says, Andreas, um, uh, Mamta is curious to know what happens to the textiles in landfills, apart from the fact that there is greenhouse gas emissions with natural fibers, um, and of course, leachate and microplastics as, as well. Um, are there any links, uh, is what she's asking. Well, I would say uh, neither synthetic fibers nor natural fibers should end up on a landfill. Uh, because this is a waste of resources uh, and landfill is always the, the worst solution. And of course we have from the landfill, we have greenhouse gas emissions. And of course we have microfibers, microfiber release, unless it is a, what it is called a sanitary or sustainable landfill, which will prevent uh, any solids or liquid, liquid uh, to get in the leachate, uh, or to, that the leachate is cleaned before release to the environment. So, uh, well, I'm not an, an expert in, in landfill technology, but from an, let's say, saving pot, let, let's, yeah, landfill is always the, the worst solution, let's say. Of course, on the short scale, it is the cheapest solution, but on the long scale, if you consider all the, 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 the the environmental problems and costs that will come for the next generations, uh, it is quite expensive. So we should, in any case, we should try to prevent any landfilling of uh, these materials. Um, thank you, Andreas. In if, this... if, if you want to know more about landfill, landfill emissions, so, so I'm not the expert in landfill, sorry. Thank you so much. Uh, in the same uh, line, Ryan Cooper is asking, should we assume that natural fibers are socially and environmentally preferable to synthetic fibers? This is a question uh, for both of us. No, we cannot say that because, well, cotton, but there was also a question, we have man-made fibers and we have natural fibers. So natural fibers are produced by nature. So the, the cotton crop is growing and so nature is creating the fiber. So basically this is a renewable fiber, but cotton cannot be considered to be a sustainable fiber because uh, it needs a, in particular to get these high yields per hectare. Uh, a lot of irrigation is necessary. A lot of uh, fertilizers, agricultural chemicals are used uh, and so, I mean, overall, and the, the environmental impact of cotton production is quite high. Of course, you, you, you cannot compare these impacts directly because uh, let's say that the land consumption of polyester fibers will be much lower because you just need a, a very limited amount of, of land. Uh, but basically it's not, renewable because it's a fossil fuel. On the other hand, you need fossil fuels to produce all these fertilizers and agricultural chemicals. Uh, so basically we have two bad solutions. 
Sorry. <laughs> um, Peter, would you like to add to that? I mean, if preferable, at, at, at some point, um, it depends which type of natural fiber. I mean, at the end, cotton has also a very important environmental impact depending on how you produce it. Um, they're here, they work, and I'm, work, I'm looking for the English word uh, hanf, uh, Andreas, maybe you how, you, how you translate hanf? Hemp. Hemp. Hanf, hemp, hemp. yes. Hemp. hemp, okay, so basically now, for example, Colombia had, in some regions, had a, um, a larger uh, um, tobacco production that was uh, worn down, and so now they're looking to, to, to regain this, uh, these areas by producing uh, natural fibers. This could have, uh, of course, a re, um, at least for, for, for countries just as Colombia that have problems with certain areas with this, uh, with illegal trade of, of certain crops that, that are not uh, allowed to, to be grown. Um, this could be a, a, a very interesting aspect, but yeah, you always have to, to, to measure which, which aspects well you're gonna be gaining with it. So the social aspect will be good. At the end, the, 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 the durability could be a problem, but at the end, you have to 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 figure out which which aspects are you going to put up front and which which will be then uh, more on the second sheet. Thank yeah, you, basically Peter. Basically, the the best fiber and the most environmentally friendly fiber is the fiber that is never produced. I think uh, that's uh, leading very well into what Professor Linda Godfrey has also typed up. Um, she's talking about not just textile waste, but food waste. And I'm sure plastics is also part of that. Um, and she's saying that this is a symptom of a much bigger underlying problem. And if we don't uh, tackle overconsumption by, albeit a very small percentage of population in the global north, um, and you know the rest of the world is also aspiring to, it's going to be very difficult for us to solve these questions. So um, I think Andreas also said the same thing. It's I think the best fiber is the one that's not produced. So we are reducing consumption and production. Um, do you want to address that comment or should we go to the next question? We will pick up the next one because yeah. I already mentioned, yes, we have a uh, uh, really huge overconsumption and uh, Yes, it, it, it makes no sense to, to recycle and reuse if we do not reduce the amount of textile put on the market. So this is the, the most urgent need. Absolutely. Um, the next question is coming for both of you. Um, which new recycling processes are you working on? So uh, Andreas and Peter. Well, basically uh, we focus on the most uh, important fiber, this is cotton and polyester, because these two fibers cover at least uh, three quarters of the market. Um, what we can see in our project that in, at least in Austria, maybe also in Europe, we have more cotton uh, than the, the production data uh, globally. So we have globally just 22% of cotton. And in, in the waste stream of Vienna, we find about 50% cotton. So I think that cotton yeah, is more expensive than polyester. So uh, richer countries can afford cotton. Uh, and also cotton and also polyester will more go to, uh, to the technical textiles. So we focus on uh, cotton and polyester. So for cotton, we have some solutions that uh, there are some companies in Europe and also in Austria. They they take cotton secondhand, cotton derived from end of life textile as an input material to produce uh, man-made sausic fibers. Uh, there are a lot of projects going on in yes in Austria, but also in Finland and in Sweden. And I think that in quite a short term, let's say in two or three years. Uh, yeah, there will be a big demand for end-of-life textiles containing cotton. So I think Sweden is already importing uh, textile waste from Asia containing cotton. And of course, this is a nice thing, but uh, the next step we have to tackle is, is the polyester. And here it is, is even more relevant because you can recycle polyester, you can recycle cotton, but if you have cotton and polyester mixed, uh, it's not 
able, you cannot recycle it. So currently we can either recycle cotton or we can recycle polyester. So we have to degrade one of these uh, polymers. And what we are working on is to, to get them to separate these two polymers uh, so we can recycle both polymers. So we are working on this. So of course, there are a lot of problems because sometimes we do not have two fibers, but we have three, four or five fibers in one single item. And we also have a lot of uh, dye stuff. We have some uh, hydrophobization, hydrophilization and so on. Uh, so there are a lot of chemicals on the surface of, of textiles, which are not even mentioned because if you look to the label, uh, the label will only give you the composition of the fibers the textile is composed of, but not uh, the non-fibrous components. So all the, the chemical stuff on the surface of the textile has not to be mentioned in the label, but these substances can make uh, recycling really difficult and even prevent uh, any recycling process. So we work on that in determining uh, which substances are really on the surface, which dye stuff we can find. So yeah, but yeah, we you can imagine we try to recycle packaging for thirty years, and now we try to recycle cotton uh, uh, textiles for three years. So it will take a little more time, and until we have really profound results that we can put let's say on a big industrial scale. Currently we work on the lab scale. Thank you, Andreas. Um, Peter, would you like to tell us about which yeah, recycling we're working, processes? Um, yes, we're also here doing a, a pilot project with uh, three companies, three larger companies of so working on the, on the recycling of, but post-industrial waste. So that means on the production lines, whenever they, they produce certain types of textiles, whatever is left over, they, 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 they try to recycle it. It's a mechanical recycling um, process. And uh, agreed with, with uh, Andreas, we, we basically focus on the natural fibers, on, on cotton and on the polyester side. Um, what we've seen and what we're now trying to, to achieve with this pilot is first of all, see what type of, of, um, of uh, textiles you can actually use up directly. So basically a kind of a, a um, uh, separation at the source, so to say, so to see how we can have the separation at the source figured out the most efficient way. And um, the second problem that we're trying to tackle is the, because after, after a certain numbers of recycling cotton, the fiber gets so short that you can actually not really use it again. So it, these are the kind of elements that we're tackling right now. Um, it's also a project that started about uh, one month ago. So um, there are still no, no results that we can publish or, or share, but I hope that at the end of the year, we will have a first, a first insight on types of, of, of textiles that we're using. And, and another one that is, 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 on, is in the pipeline, but we don't know how to tackle, maybe Andreas can at some point help us here, is basically everything that, that, is, um, that has this stretchy aspect, you, how you call it this, uh, like, for example, like the, the, for example, the bikinis or the, or the bathing suits that are some kind of stretchy. Yeah, and this this is very a big issue because here in Latin America and at least in Colombia there is a, a large production of these type of textiles and a large market also for this. So we have a lot of waste that comes with these elements and and this is kind of a headache. But text uh, mechanical production uh, mechanical recycling for uh, cotton and polyester are on, on our top list. Thank you, uh, thank you, Peter. Um, going into the next question because we have a limited, I think, six seven minutes left of this webinar. Um, Jamie asks, have you seen any innovative models for making collection and sorting more efficient? I mean, now that we're going to have separate collection of textiles from 2025, I think, in Europe. So um, both of you can answer this question. Well, currently, at least in Europe, the, the, any collection systems except France are funded by mainly charity organizations, or performed by charity organizations, and they are, by, are funded by selling secondhand clothes. So these uh, companies just ask for re-variable items, so they do not tackle recyclable items. So this has to be changed when we, uh, when it comes to recycling. So I've seen in Finland they have a, a dual system now. So charity organizations ask people to dispose of reusable items, and the municipalities have implemented a separate collection of non-reusable textiles. Uh, by the beginning of this year, 
and it seems that it works quite well in Finland. Uh, well, uh, Finland is, I think, a very unique country in Europe because if you tell the Finns do this, do and do that, and you explain them why they should do it, well, they just do it. I think it will be quite hard to implement this system one by one in other European countries. So uh, we had thousands of uh, of <clears throat> collection bins for pet bottles in Vienna, but the collection rate was uh, just about thirty percent. So I think that uh, it's, it will it is it is quite tricky. Uh, to increase, uh, well, to get a really prof efficient system to collect textiles. And there is, I think there's not a, uh, a, a system that will, will work in all countries. So, uh, of course, I think you have to work with the awareness of the people to have to explain them why it makes sense uh, to put certain items in a certain a bin, which will be more easy for rewearables, because if if a piece of textile and a piece of apparel is still wearable, so maybe people have ethical to concerns to put it in the residual waste. But for damaged items, it will be quite hard. So I think there will. I don't see that there is a, a unique solution for 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 Europe and or the global. You need a special system. In the willow, well, which has to be considered, uh, well, the, yeah, the, the people living in this country. So, yeah, I agree. I agree, but we also have another aspect in Latin America. It's also the 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 um, the, the the social uh, disbalance that we have. So we have uh, certain uh, um, yeah uh, certain uh, areas of, for example, of cities and the country where people where we have a lot of. Uh, poor people, less privileged people, and they there to convince them to recycle, to convince them or to to separate, is not that easy. So what we're doing basically here is to try to to link the recycling and the separation to a certain brand and to to certain types of 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 of, of textiles. So we're we're including not only the awareness rising on on the on the social side, but also how we can include certain brands to to help and facilitate. The, the recyclability of certain clothes, because at, at the end you have so many different types of, of, of textiles uh, that it makes it very difficult to have a, a standardized uh, or, a, or at least a more or less common uh, separation system. It's not going to work like that. I think the separation for textiles is going to be uh, a very, very linked to certain brands and to certain products that they put on the market. I don't think you can do it like we have it in, for example, in Germany, that you can have papers and plastics and organic waste, and then you have three or four bins and that's it. I think in textile, it's going to be a bit more complex. At least that's what we're seeing here. Thank you so much, uh, Peter. We have very interesting questions. I'm just going through them right now, uh, but we have time to take maybe one last one. And uh, I think I'll just pick the one that's next, which is from Karthik. Karthik says, uh, is asking actually, is maximizing cascading and um, diversion of waste to energy as last resort uh, solution for textiles, given currently there are no matured recycling solutions. I wasn't quite sure if I understood the last part. Could you repeat the last part? Yeah, so given that there are no currently matured recycling solutions for textiles, um, is diversion of uh, waste to energy, I mean, so pushing it to waste to energy, is it the last resort? Uh, is it the best solution at the moment? Uh, at least for the cooperate, German cooperation, it's not, uh, it's not a solution that we really have on top of mind. It's in, in the, uh, we try to avoid as far as we can the, 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 uh, the, um, the energy or the waste to energy aspect because it gives a very easy way to just ignore everything else. I mean, if you do this for, for uh, energy, for, if you plan this as a solution, you kind of have problems then later justifying why you're doing all this uh, costly and expensive aspects of separating, of recycling, of upcycling, of refurnishing and everything. So we kind of, in our narrative, of course, this is a solution. We know that it's uh, it's used worldwide. We know that Germany also uses waste to energy, but the question is what type of products you, you or what kind of waste you're going to put into your uh, energy, uh, waste to energy uh, stream. And this is something that as soon as we don't have, 
we don't figure it out and we don't have it here in the countries kind of going, we, we don't like to talk about it and we don't like to present it as an aspect because yeah, at the end it's, it's, it's a, it, it kind of uh, uh, it, um, limits our narrative on the other, on the other end. So we, we do not go into it. So I can't really say anything more about this. Uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, I think you you made your point clear. Andreas, if you want to add something to that point, and then I'm going to pass it over back to Shweta. Yeah, as I mentioned, we have just about 1% fiber to fiber recycling. And of course, in between uh, waste to energy, we have some cascade utilization like cleaning and wiping racks or to make some non-wovens of low quality, which can be used, let's say, for in the automotive industry or in the construction industry, uh, which most likely, or in many cases, will be more favorable than a pure waste to energy. But finally, where the aim has to be to, to go for a real circle so that we can perform a fiber to fiber recycling. But uh, yes, I think that the, the main, okay, if this is not possible, any other solution, then uh, landfill is, yeah, has to be done. So even, so if the mm -hmm. choice is landfill or incineration, then of course, go to waste to energy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, at this point, I mean, we still have a lot of open questions. Shweta, what would be the next steps? I mean, can we gather these questions and then share with the speakers, perhaps? Yep. What we will do is I will uh, share a document and then the, both Peter and Andreas can add to it. And when we publish the webinar on the Waste Rice website, which will be in another couple of weeks, the answers will go up along with the recording. Perfect. Perfect. So, any Thank you uh, so much. before we close, any uh, last thoughts from Peter, Andreas, as well as from other people? Please share. Uh, let's just cover up last thoughts and then close the webinar. Uh, do you want to go first, Peter? Okay. Uh, well, I mean, um, from our side, um, the 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 topic of uh, circular economy in the textile sector is is a uh, is a tough one. I think it's one it's, it's going to be a very very um, long and 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 very deep discussion with regards on how to tackle it. So from my point of, uh, of from my line of work and where we are right now, any ally is 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 welcome. Uh, so if here we have in the audience any any uh, experts, uh, companies that have ideas or that that want to join this this uh, process, feel free to contact us. We are we're very happy to to at some point see what we can do together. Uh, we're working also on um, on uh, an international knowledge cooperation here for the textile sector with Colombia. So if there is any interest or something, feel free. And yes, we're definitely uh, at, the, at the beginning, but uh, we see that there are a lot of low hanging fruits that we can tackle. So I hope that we at some point at the end of the year, beginning of the next can share some new uh, insights in it. And thank you very much for having me here and uh, hope to see you at some point uh, soon. Okay, so I will not focus on recycling. So last year I've been in a conference and there was a uh, what, what is called focus sessions. It was a discussion, a panel discussion on fast fashion. And a colleague asked me to write a teaser for this. And I sent him a, a paragraph and some of colleagues said, oh, this is really good. And I think the last sentence, I think I can, this will be my last sentence today. It was about, we do want fashion to be a, let's say a playground uh, for, for designers and creative people. So we do not want to have all the same clothes, but we have to stop the pathologic overconsumption. So I think this, uh, yeah, I think we have to find this solution in between these two uh, extremes. Yeah, thank you. This was a very short last word. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Andreas. And now uh, thank you, Aditi and Amburi Global for putting this uh, webinar together along with DWaste Twice. Thanks to all the audience uh, members. Uh, just uh, a reminder to Peter and Andreas, could you share your email IDs on chat in case uh, anyone wants to get in touch with you? And uh, a reminder to the audience that our next webinar will be next week on the future of circularity in 
electrical appliances. So please uh, head to our LinkedIn. You will have uh, the link and you can register over there and do sign up to our newsletter as well to get regular updates. Thanks a lot, everyone. Have a good day, Peter, and have a good evening, Andreas, and a good night to Madhuti and me. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.